334 is our opening praise this morning, 334, a hymn of testimony and thanksgiving. It was down at the feet of Jesus, so that happy, happy day that my soul found peace in believing and my sins were washed away. Let me tell the old, old story. We're going to stand together, please, as we sing 334. <clears throat> Let's unite our hearts together and call upon the name of our God this morning. God knows our needs. He knows our hearts, our thoughts, our downsetting, our uprising, all about yesterday, all about today, and all about tomorrow. And let's just come before the throne of grace in the Savior's precious name. Do you remember some that are unwell at this time? Frida Hamill still in hospital there in the Ulster, and she's just recovering from surgery last uh, Wednesday and ask you to pray for Frida that the Lord will encourage her at this time. She's just not so well and want you to remember Frida especially. She's been diagnosed as most of you know with cancer and Stella Hicks, God willing, is getting home tomorrow so we're thankful for that and just remember others connected with some families here that are unwell in these days. Let's call upon the Lord and pray together and ask God's Spirit to be with us today in a special way. Let's see God's face just now. Loving God and eternal Father, we come with humble hearts and with thanksgiving before the very throne of God itself. We rejoice today that we do not come before a throne of judgment, but Lord, we come before a throne of grace. And it's all because of the Son of God the Lord Jesus Christ, his sinless life, his atoning death upon a cross, the precious blood that he shed, his glorious resurrection, and the fact that he ever lives to intercede and to pray for his people. Before the throne of God above, I have a strong, a perfect plea, a great high priest whose name is love, who ever lives and pleads for me. Lord, we are so thankful and so privileged and so blessed this morning to be able to address the God who fills eternity, the everlasting God as our Father. After this manner, therefore, pray ye, saying, Our Father which art in heaven, 
hallowed be thy name. Lord, we thank thee today that we have been born again of the Spirit of God, adopted into thy family, and we can say like the Apostle John, behold what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us, that we should be called the sons of God. Lord God, impress this reality upon our hearts as never before. Lord, enable us today to understand it and give us grace to take it in, just what it means to be a child of God in this world. So often, O God, we struggle with fear and worry and anxiety and temptation, Lord, and we carry our own burdens, and yet there's a, a Father in heaven who is able and willing to hear our cry. The eye of the Lord is upon the righteous. His ear is open unto their cry. As a father pitieth his children, so the Lord pitieth them that fear him. And Lord, we come before thee now in the precious name of thy Son. And our God and our Father, we pray that thou will bless each and every one gathered here today. We thank you, Lord, for the people of God. Thank thee, Lord, for every brother and every sister. We thank thee, Lord God, for every individual gathered within these walls this morning. And thank you, Lord God, for every head bowed in thy presence. And Lord, we pray that you will draw alongside each and every one and meet us all at the point of need. We thank you, Lord God, for those who today, Lord, can testify to the blessing of God. And yet, Lord, there are some that are downcast, undoubtedly, some, Lord, that are struggling, some, Lord, that are facing, Lord, trials in their lives. Lord, some that are still struggling, Lord, with bereavement. Some, Lord, that have loved ones that are unwell. Lord, we do remember those who are laid aside at this time. Some here this morning, O oh God, have parents, Lord, that have needs. Some, Lord, have loved ones that are in hospital. And we just pray for each and every one that, Lord, I will answer prayer, that I will intervene that I will step in. We thank you, Lord God, for thy hand upon Frida and upon Stella. We pray, O oh God, that they will both be out of hospital again very soon. And we pray, O oh Father, that thou will perfect that which concerns them. We ask, O oh God, today that thou will pour out of thy spirit. Remember this world that we live in with all of its strife and all of its pain and all of its sorrow and suffering. Lord, we thank you today for the gospel that provides assurance and hope and purpose and meaning and gives the answers, O God. And we pray that thou wilt help us, Lord, to live to thy glory. And Lord, to do what we can with the means that God has given in the time that God has allotted. We pray, Lord, that you will help us to live lives that count in light of eternity. So, Father, Lord, we look to Thee. Remember those that are on the mission field today. We thank Thee, Lord, for the good reports that we're hearing of the work of God in different parts of the world. And we pray for those who, connected with their own denomination, are preparing themselves for missionary service. We think of Elizabeth today, and we pray that Thou will bless her. Thank Thee for bringing her home again from her time in Kenya. We pray, O oh God, for the Macaulay family and for the Hamilton family as well. And we thank Thee, Lord, for those who are serving Thee faithfully in the mission fields of the world. And we pray, O oh God, that wherever there's a faithful ambassador of Jesus Christ in this land and in this world, this morning that Thou will be pleased to give encouragement. Remember those that are experiencing persecution. So it's some that are in prison today because of their faith. Some, O oh God, that have been separated from their families and loved ones and, Lord, are under trial today because they love Jesus Christ. Some, Lord, that are not able to meet publicly to worship Thee. Lord God, we are so privileged here today. Lord, remember the persecuted church. Remember Israel today and all it concerns that region, Lord, of the world. We think of the Ukraine and all that's going on there too. And we pray, O oh Father, that the Spirit of God will move, that you'll bring healing to these nations that are broken. And Lord, remember this land of ours. Oh, for the floods on a thirsty land. Oh, for a mighty revival. Oh, for a sanctified, fearless band ready to heal its arrival. Lord, encourage thy people here. Encourage those who are not able to be with us. Bless us now. Lead us on with thyself. In the Savior's name we pray. Amen. 184 is our next hymn, 184, and 
just while you're looking up the place in your hymn book, can we welcome you, each and every one, in the Savior's name? Can we thank you for joining us today? It's lovely to see so many gathered in, and we do remember some that are not with us, some that are unwell, some that are on holidays, others that are preaching and participating in services elsewhere. But we're glad to see you, and if you're visiting today, you're especially welcomed, and we thank you for coming. We're going to sing 184. There is a book that comes to me from one who spake of old. The words are on the screen, or if you choose, you can use your hymn book, and then immediately after, Mr. Douglas will read God's Word, and then our brother Noel will bring the announcements. So just in that order, hymn 184, then the reading of God's Word, and then directly after that, the announcements. Let us all turn to the Word of God together, reading today from 2 Timothy, the second epistle to Timothy, and the chapter 3. While you're turning up the place, may I mention that Mr. George McConnell has been the inspiration for a new book which he has had a large part in, in producing. Really, we have snippets from the lives of 25 different people who were there at the beginning of the work, at the beginning of the Free Presbyterian testimony. 25 names. And when you start reading these accounts, you just want to read more. And that's where the story ends, because these are just encapsulations of uh, the people who are mentioned here. And then another remark that you could very, very easily make 
fact, it'd be difficult not to make it uh, that 25 people, there are ever so many more who would qualify 100% to have their story told in a book like this. And who knows if there's a great deal of interest in this one. It's called These Are the Names. That Mr. McConnell and Reverend David Linden may be encouraged to go on and produce volume number two. But all these people were known to me. I feel that when I'm looking at the list here, I'm, I'm looking at a list of people whom I knew personally, and, and nearly all of them I knew intimately. Uh, now the book is priced at seven ninety nine, and I'm saying that's eight pounds just for convenience. And uh, if you would be interested in ordering a copy, uh, to my way of thinking, there's a sheet on the table. Maybe you'd put your name on that sheet, and uh, then since uh, we're looking at eight pounds here, if you can put eight pounds in an envelope. Uh, just put your name on it, make sure, make sure you put your name on it. Uh, then give it to Mr. Norton, who can look after it for us. Uh, these are the names. I was asked to write the introduction. And, and really, that's the title of my introduction, which is passed over to describe the whole of the book. And really, that's what I had intended anyway. But taken from the book of Exodus, chapter 1, verse 1. These are the names. What a great day it's going to be when the Lord, the King of glory, opens the book in heaven. Not just 25 names, but millions upon millions. Redeemed by blood. Born of God. Taken to glory. This is just a foretaste of heaven. Uh, I'll say no more about it at this time. Maybe I'll make remarks on it again, but I'd like to say a wee bit about the introduction. But then if you get a copy, uh, I'd like to think the introduction speaks for itself. Here we have this chapter from God's Word, Second Timothy, and the chapter 3. Beginning at verse 1. This know also. There are lots of things a Christian needs to know. Christian especially. You're a child of God. Seated now in this congregation. There are things you need to know. And know very, very clearly. In your mind. Uh, this is an addition to the, the collection this know also that in the last days perilous times shall come for men shall be lovers of their own selves covetous boasters proud blasphemers disobedient to parents unthankful unholy without natural affection truth breakers false accusers incontinent, fierce, despisers of those that are good, traitors, heavy, high-minded, lovers of pleasures more than lovers of God, having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof from such turn away. For of this sort are they which creep into houses and lead captive silly women laden with sins, led away with divers' lusts, ever learning, but never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. Now, as John is and John is, and we take these to be the names of uh, those magicians that Pharaoh employed to withstand Moses 
and answer all his signs, sign for sign, and demonstration for demonstration. It's interesting in the New Testament to see information that you don't get in the Old Testament. Information about the Old Testament that's so skillfully wrought into the narratives of the New Testament. Now here these men are just singled out from a way, way back then in ancient time. Now as John is and John Brez withstood Moses, so do these also resist the truth. Men of corrupt minds, reprobate concerning the faith. But they shall proceed no further, for their folly shall be manifest unto all men, as theirs also was. But thou hast fully known my doctrine, manner of life, purpose, faith, long-suffering, charity, patience, persecutions, afflictions, which came unto me at Antioch, at Iconium, at Lystra, what persecutions I endured. But out of them all, the Lord delivered me. Yea, and all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. But evil men and seducers shall wax worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. But continue thou in the things which thou hast learned, and hast been assured of, knowing of whom thou hast learned them, that from a child thou hast known the holy scriptures, which are able to make thee wise unto salvation through faith, which is in Christ Jesus. All scripture is given by inspiration of God, and it's profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, truly furnished unto all good works. Praise the Lord for the reading of Holy Scripture today. May the Lord bless the reading of his word and the preaching of it too, for his name's sake. We extend a very warm welcome to each one here in the Saviour's name special welcome to those who are visiting with us. It's good to have visitors. Glad you're able to be with us at this time. Also a warm welcome to Elizabeth, who's returned from Kenya. I know she's uh, spent many hours flying. And it's good to see you back again safely. We also thank those who join with us over the internet. It's good that you're able to tune in to our service this morning. It's a wonderful thing to be in the house of God, amongst the people of God, amongst those who pray. There's great blessings, and may each of us this morning know something of that blessing it is to be in the Lord's house. I encourage everyone to come back again at 7 p.m. tonight. We're having a special testimony. Kyle Boyd is coming along. He's from Cross Gar. From birth, this young man has lived with disability. But the Lord wonderfully saved him and kept him and blessed him to this day. And he will come tonight and tell his story. Also, special singer tonight from Victoria and Key. And I encourage everyone to come back again for this evening's meeting. The meeting is uh, preceded by the half hour of prayer, as usual. 
Monday night prayer meeting is to be conducted by Mr. Adam Kennedy. He's a student at the Whitfield College. The Reverend Higginson, uh, he's engaged in a week of meetings. He's taken Balamoni's uh, Bible week. It'll be a busy week for him, and I'm sure he would appreciate your prayers for him as he travels up each night to that special week of meetings. Tuesday morning, 9.30 a.m., outreach workers, they're going out into the neighborhood with gospel literature. 10 a.m., mother and toddlers, they're resuming after the Easter break. And then on Wednesday morning, 7 a.m., is the early morning prayer meeting. Some may only be able to come for a short time. If that's um, all you can afford, then you're, you're very welcome. It's good. And there is flexibility. People can, can come and go. Good to see you at that uh, prayer meeting, 7 a.m. on Wednesday. The children's meetings on Wednesday night, uh, they have now finished for the season. However, uh, there is a Bible club starting on Monday week in the church here that's running through from Monday to Friday at 7 p.m. And prayer has been requested that the Lord will work, work amongst the children and work amongst this, um, this, these special meetings. Would the Wednesday night workers um, please meet for a short time in the old junior youth room after this morning's meeting? Uh, the McGabry Holiday Bible Club, it doesn't take place until um, early July. Friday morning at 11 a.m., uh, the Reverend Higginson, he plans to carry on the regular uh, open air meeting in the city centre. Friday night, uh, the junior youth, they're meeting from 7 to 8.30. Um, your special Sunday evening service is coming up. And this week will take the form of a practice. And the leaders have asked if they could have a full attendance, please, as these practices are important. Then on Friday night, the Senior Fellowship, they are meeting at 8 p.m. Nigel Campbell speaking on the subject of anxiety. I'm sure both speaker and young people will be very pleased to meet for the first time in their new youth room. That's this Friday night at 8 p.m. Next Lord's Day, Sunday school at 10 a.m., Bible class 10.20. The regular services 11 and 7. Thank you for your attention. I'd like to thank Noel so much for bringing the announcements for the incoming week and also to Dr. Douglas for reading God's precious word. There's also a couple of dates for your diary, and uh, I'd like you to pray about a couple of events that we hope to host in uh, the new annex here. Uh, a number of years ago, I suppose it was, I was thinking a lot about some of the shelter dwellings all around this locality for people with special needs, and right across our city, and how we might be able to reach uh, such people and uh, encourage them and uh, comfort them in any way that we can. And so I thought this new facility might be good for that. And around about the same time, one of our ministers, Reverend Peter McIntyre, put out a, a text on a minister's group, and he was thinking along the same lines. So we came together along with a couple of other ministers, and on May the 18th, we're going to be having a, a special meeting. It's going to be very informal, low-key, just in the annex on a Saturday afternoon, uh, to bring people in from the locality and across uh, the province from some of our other churches who maybe struggle with physical handicaps or uh, mental needs, uh, just to encourage them and bring them together and uh, have some fellowship with them, and maybe have some singing and a short uh, epilogue from God's Word. Nothing too heavy and nothing too formal, but just to encourage such people and then give them something to eat as well. So if that's something that you could pray about, we would appreciate that. Or if it's something you're able to help out with, we would appreciate that as well. That's going to be on Saturday afternoon, the 18th of May, and we're testing the waters. We'll see what the response is. And if we feel that it's profitable and successful, we'll maybe have it a little bit more often. But there's such a need. It was across there, just the way there's a sheltered dwelling there with people with different needs and was speaking to the supervisor and she said that they'd be very, very happy to come along and 
uh, bring their, their residents along with them. And we trust that that will be replicated right across our city. And we look forward to this event on May the 18th. It's going to be called Helping Hands. And we'd ask you, as we say, to pray for that. And if you can help out in some practical way, that would be appreciated as well. And then on the 11th of May, that's a Saturday evening as well, we hope to have a youth rally. And we're still organizing that uh, for young people right across our denomination and uh, hopefully in the city as well to reach out and to bring young people in to encourage them and to share the word of God with them. So those two Saturdays consecutively, the 11th of May in the evening and then the 18th of May in the afternoon with that new ministry. Do you remember tonight our brother Kyle Boyd as he comes, come and support God's servant, bring your friends with you if you can, why not send a text out or make a phone call and invite somebody along. Kyle's a lovely young man, the Lord has blessed him and the Lord has used him and we're looking forward as well to Victoria who's going to be ministering in song this evening. So let's just have another hymn together as the offering is received, number 695, hymn 695. Just remaining seated as the offering is lifted, you know this chorus, this hymn well, I am so glad that her Father in heaven tells of his love in the book he has given. 695, remaining seated please as the offering is lifted, 695. my mistake. We'll stand together please for verses 3 and the rest of the hymn. Sorry about that. Let's stand as we sing.
That's wonderful, singing, that chorus is beautiful. I don't know who was doing the parts, it almost sounded like it had been practiced before, but it was lovely to hear that spontaneous, I don't know what you call it, but that, you know what I mean, that bit in the chorus, it sounded so good. Let's uh, turn together please to 2 Timothy and the third chapter please, 2 Timothy chapter 3. Our text today is verse 15 of this wonderful chapter. And we've been thinking over the last number of weeks about the Word of God, God's wonderful Word, God's Word for our world, God's precious book, the Bible. And this morning it's verse 15, and we're just thinking very simply this morning about the book that saves. Listen to what Paul says as he writes to Timothy, who's a young servant of the Lord, starting out in his ministry and service for Christ. And Paul reminds him of this great a blessing that Timothy has experienced, and that from a child thou hast known the holy scriptures which are able to make thee wise unto salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. What a text. And that from a child thou hast known the holy scriptures which are able to make thee wise unto salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. Let's pray together. Call upon the Lord and ask Him to speak by His Spirit through His Word to each and every heart. Father, we thank Thee once again today for this precious book that we have. What a blessing it is to have in our hands the very Word of God in a language that we can understand. We thank Thee, Lord God, for Thy faithfulness in preserving Thy Word. We thank Thee, Lord, that this book is a book that we can trust. Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my word shall never pass away. We pray today that thy word will have free course and be glorified. And grant, O God, today that through thy word some precious soul might come to know Christ and enter into the wonderful experience of God's salvation. Hear and answer prayer. We ask it with thanksgiving in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. During the uh, American Civil War many years ago, a young soldier signed up for the army. I'm not sure if he was a Union soldier or a Confederate soldier, but he was a young man brought up in the gospel but had no real interest in the things of God. He just wanted to go to the battle and fight for what he thought was right. Through a process of time, he was elevated to a high position within the army. He became a captain within a certain regiment. And as so many young soldiers had, he had a a copy of God's Word in his breast pocket. It was often the case, young men in that part of the world, and even during the First and Second World Wars uh, from Britain as well, people were presented with a copy of the Bible. And during one of the great battles, a fortress was taken over. And as they were settling down for the night, that young uh, captain within the army found that a musket ball had lodged into the copy of the Word of God that was in his breast pocket covering his heart. And he realized that that Bible literally had saved his life. It was a remarkable thing. Whenever he opened the Bible and found the place where the musket ball had gone through from the front leather cover through the book of Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, he found that the ball had lodged itself in the book of Ecclesiastes. And it was pinpointed there in verse 9 of the 11th chapter. Rejoice, O young man, in thy youth, and let thy heart cheer thee all the days of thy youth. And walk in the ways of thine heart and in the sight of thine own eyes. But know thou that for all these things God will bring thee into judgment. And as he read that verse, and in the backdrop of that unusual course of events, he came under conviction of sin. He realized that if it hadn't been for that Bible, that bullet would have gone into his heart. And almost certainly he'd have been out into God's eternity facing judgment. He came under conviction, he repented of his sins, and he was wonderfully and powerfully converted. And so the Word of God not only saved him physically, but the Word of God saved him spiritually and also eternally. Truly this morning the Bible is a book 
that saves, the lives that the Word of God has transformed and blessed, is another wonderful testimony to the integrity of the Word of God of God. Over the last number of weeks, we've been bringing the Bible to the dock, as it were. The Word of God stands accused by this world as being inaccurate, as being the words of men, as being just a book of fables. And we have been bringing the Bible week after week to the dock and calling certain reliable witnesses to come and testify and to speak as to the integrity of the Bible. We have considered the words of our Lord Jesus Christ, the first and foremost witness. We have called the Bible to speak for itself as it's entitled to do so. We have called archeology span and history to testify. We have called science to testify as well. And I'm sure if you've been listening in that you've realized that the Word of God stands and proves itself to be what it claims to be, God's inspired Word. And today we're calling the church to witness to the integrity of God's precious Word. And by church, I mean the whole body of redeemed sinners. That's what the church is, as it's revealed in Scripture. Those whom the Lord has called out from the world, separated unto Himself, washed in His blood, and saved by His grace. And every true Christian is a member of the true church. And every true Christian, every real Christian can testify to some degree or other as to the integrity of the Bible. There is no other book in this world of ours that is given hope and given the answers that mankind needs and that mankind has in the way that the Word of God has. The Bible is a book that saves for time and also for eternity. Millions of lives, millions of homes, millions of families, and millions of destinies have been changed for the better through the Bible. The existence of the entire church in the Old Testament and in the New and throughout the history of the last 2,000 years is explicitly due to the teaching of the Word of God. Since New Testament times, the true church of Jesus Christ has had as its foundation the Scriptures, the Word of God, the Bible, from Genesis to Revelation. And as long as we have the Bible as our foundation, the gates of hell will never prevail against the church of Jesus Christ. God's truth is marching on. And the religion of the Bible is the oldest religion in the world. And here in 2 Timothy chapter 3, Paul is writing his last letter to Timothy. He's passing the baton on. He's passing the mantle across. Paul's life is drawing to a close. He knows, according to verse 4, the time of my departure is at hand. I am now ready to be offered. And so he writes to Timothy and encourages Timothy to hold fast to the words of sound doctrine. Hold fast to the words of life. And then reminds him in verse 15 of chapter 3 of 2 Timothy, Timothy, from a child, from your earliest days, thou hast known the holy scriptures which are able to make thee wise unto salvation through the faith which is in Christ Jesus. Paul is writing to Timothy, reminding him of this precious book, this book that saves. And I want you to notice three very simple and maybe very obvious truths that lie on the surface of this great text of Scripture. The first thing that I want you to consider is this, the privilege of having and the privilege of knowing the Word of God, the Holy Scripture, that from a child thou hast known the Holy Scriptures. And surely Paul is reminding Timothy here of the wonderful privilege that Timothy has enjoyed from his earliest days, the privilege of having and the privilege of knowing and the privilege of being instructed in the Word of God. 
Timothy was born into a home that God had blessed. First, or 2 Timothy 1 and verse number 5, Paul reminds Timothy of the unfeigned faith that is in thee, and the faith which dwelt first in thy grandmother Lois, and in thy mother Eunice, and I am persuaded that in thee also Timothy had been born into a home where his mother was a Christian, his grandmother was a Christian, and through their prayers and through their influence and through their teaching, Timothy has come to know the Word of God, and Timothy has become a Christian himself. What a privilege to have a Christian mother or a Christian father or a Christian grandfather, or a Christian grandmother. Some of you have experienced and enjoyed that privilege right from your earliest days, from the day that you were born. Your mother prayed for you. Maybe your grandmother prayed for you. Maybe your father was a man of the book. Maybe your grandfather was a man of God. And you cannot remember a time whenever you were ignorant of the truth of the Word of God. What a privilege to be born into a Christian home, and what a privilege it is to know something of the Word of God. Timothy had the privilege of knowing the Scriptures. He knew, I'm sure, that God created the world in the space of six days and then rested in the seventh day. Timothy knew that God created a perfect world and God said that it was good. Timothy knew that there was something wrong with this world. He knew that sin had entered in and destroyed the human race. Timothy also knew the Old Testament scriptures that pointed to the Savior. He knew that God had sent His Son to be the Savior of the world. He knew that the Son of God died on a cross, shed His blood, was buried, and rose again. Timothy knew that there was a heaven. Timothy knew that there was a hell. Timothy knew that there was a day of judgment. He knew that Jesus Christ is coming back again. Timothy knew the necessity of faith and the necessity of repentance. And Timothy had responded positively to the privileges that he was blessed with. Now, every single one of us this morning has been given the great privilege of knowing something of what the Word of God actually teaches. You, perhaps, from a child, have known something of the Holy Scriptures, the written Word set apart. That's what Holy Scriptures mean. A written book set apart, and God has placed this book in your hand, in your home, and you've been taught the Scriptures from your earliest days. What a privilege. But maybe unlike Timothy, you have not been thankful for the privileges that God has blessed you with. It may be that to some point you've even begun to despise some of the privileges of being born into a Christian home. Mom and dad are so out of sorts with the world that I live in. Mom and dad don't really understand society as it is today. They don't understand the pressures that I face as a young person. Man, it's a drag to come along to church Sunday after Sunday. What a bore to sit in Sunday school or children's meetings or youth fellowship or to have to listen to Dad open the Bible almost every day and read it and, and pray with us as a family and maybe give thanks for the, the food that's on our tables. I just want to get out in the world and live a little bit. I don't really appreciate being brought up in a Christian home, in a Bible-preaching church, and having the Word of God presented to me faithfully. Oh, it's so restrictive. I want to go out and live a little bit. And maybe you're despising the privileges that God has given you. Young person today, can I tell you from personal experience that in this precious book is life? In this book this morning is liberty? In this book this morning, there's freedom, there's guidance, there's provision, there's help, there's counsel, there's comfort, there's joy unspeakable and full of glory. This book points you to heaven. This book will give you life. This book will give you meaning and purpose in your life. What a privilege to have the Word of God. It shows us how we can know our Creator 
how we can enjoy God forever, how we can know Him and glorify Him, and how we can evade all of the pitfalls and snares and traps and things in this world that can so easily destroy us mentally and physically and emotionally and spiritually and eternally. What a privilege to have the Word of God. Little children's chorus says, untold millions are still untold. And yet we have been told, some of us from our childhood days, the message of the Bible. Back in the 1800s, an artist by the name of Thomas Jones Barker painted on canvas what he described in the title of his painting as the secret of England's greatness. It was a picture of Queen Victoria presenting a copy of the Bible, the Word of God, to an African envoy in the audience chamber at Windsor. And the title is self-explanatory. Queen Victoria is saying, at that time, whenever the British Empire was at its zenith, at its height, and the sun never set on the British Empire, and Royal Britannia ruled the waves, and she was saying, this book is the secret of England's greatness. And dear friends, today the Bible is the secret of any person's greatness. We can only rise to the heights that the Word of God brings us to. And if we cast the Word of God to one side, we will never experience true greatness. Mary Jones, a young Welsh girl, walked for mile upon mile because she heard there was a place in the hills of southern Wales where she could receive a copy of the Bible. Thomas Chalmers heard about her journey and was so convicted that so many young people in Wales were growing up without the Bible. And he started a great movement whereby he endeavored to get the Word of God into the hands of the youth. And that paved the way for many gracious moves of the Spirit and revivals right throughout the nation of Wales. Dear friends, this morning men died. Throughout history there were men who laid down their lives and were burned alive and torn asunder and went to an early grave so we might have the Word of God in a language that we could understand. And yet, sadly and tragically, our society is turning away from the Word of God, trying to operate without this book. It's like throwing away the instruction manual for an appliance and then discovering to your detriment that you don't really know how to use it. And in trying to use it, you destroy it because you've ignored the instructions. God created us for a supreme purpose. And God knows what we are and who we are and how we are to operate mentally, emotionally, psychologically, socially, morally, and spiritually, and collectively. And if we get rid of the Bible and we throw the instruction manual away, we don't know who we are. We don't know why we're here, we don't know what our destiny is, and we don't know how we're supposed to live in this world. That's why the Bible is still the best instruction before leaving earth. Abandon the Bible and it's back to the jungle. There's no purpose, there's no guidance, there are no answers. Charles Haddon Spurgeon, the Prince of Preachers, one day addressing his great congregation in London in the Metropolitan Tabernacle, made this statement. He said, some of you could write the word damnation on the dust on the front of your Bibles. Multitudes today are lost in spite of the great privileges that they enjoy. That from a child, thou hast known the Holy Scriptures. I see here in this text the privilege of, of having the Scriptures or the privilege of knowing the Scriptures. I also see in our text the power that is in the Scriptures, that from a child thou hast known the Holy Scriptures, which are able. And the word that is translated able there in our English Bible comes from the Greek word dunamina, from which we get the word power. So Paul is saying to Timothy, from your earliest days, you have had and been blessed with and known the written word of God, which have the power to make you wise unto salvation. There is power in the word of God. 
And the word able there is power in the present tense. Power in the continual sense. Timothy, from your earliest days, you have known the Scriptures, and even then they were powerful. Timothy, they are powerful presently. Timothy, they will be powerful eternally. The Word of God is a living Word. It's eternally powerful. It is forever settled in heaven. Hebrews 4, verse 12, the Word of God is quick or living and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword. This word that is translated able is the same word from we get, the English word dynamite. And the word dynamite denotes explosive power. A stick of dynamite can change things suddenly. A stick of dynamite can change things dramatically. And so it is with the Word of God. The Bible, the Word of God, is God's dynamite. Paul speaks about the power of the gospel. It's the dynamite of God. I heard years ago about a young lad. He had a copy of the New Testament. It was all of the scriptures that he had. He devoured it. He read it continually. He carried it with him until at last his little New Testament Bible was falling apart. And so it was cheaper in those days to go and, and get the book rebound. And he went to a book binder and he says, can you rebind my copy of the New Testament? The man told him to come back in a couple of days. Whenever he went back, his New Testament Bible was bound in red leather. But he didn't have punches small enough to have the words, the New Testament, written on the spine of his Bible. Instead, he had just taken the initials of the New Testament and had punched in the spine of his Bible the letters TNT for the New Testament. And the New Testament, the Bible, is the dynamite of God. It's powerful. It is the ability to change lives. It changed Jacob's life, the twister. It changed the life of Rahab, the prostitute. It changed the life of Manasseh, the idolater. It changed the life of Naaman, the leper. It changed the life of Mary Magdalene, the adulterer. It changed the life of the demoniac, the man that was possessed with demons. It changed the life of the prodigal, the backslider. It changed the life of Zacchaeus, the crook. It changed the life of the dying thief who had wasted his life. It changed the life of the hard-hearted centurion. It changed the life of Nicodemus, the dissatisfied religionist. It changed the life of the Ethiopian eunuch, the heathen. It changed the life of Saul of Tarsus, the persecutor. It changed the life of Cornelius, a man who was morally upright. It changed the life of Lydia, a hard-working young woman. It changed the life of the Philippian jailer, a man that was hard against the gospel. And it also changed the life of Timothy, a good, clean-living upstanding young man who needed the grace of God in his life, the same as everybody else. And the Word of God can change you dynamically this morning. It has got that power, that ability, and that authority. The Word of God can explode any excuse, any habit, any vice that you have. And of course, this word that gives us the word dynamite is also the same word that gives us the word dynamo. Dynamite is explosive power. A dynamo is something that provides continual, consistent, and controlled power. Some of our older members today might have years ago had a little dynamo attached to your bicycle. A little generator there, and there's a wheel that connected to your tire that spun around, and that gives sufficient power to give light to your bicycle. And then whenever you stopped pedaling for any period of time, the light went out. And it just denoted a, a continual power. As long as the dynamo was turning, there was light. And as long as we have the Word of God opened, the Word of God brings life and light and liberty. The Bible gives us power in continual supply. We can read it every morning and every evening, any time during the day, week after week, month upon month, year upon year, decade upon decade, century upon century, the Word of God has continually been supplying power to the church of Jesus Christ to walk this world and to swim 
against the tide. The Bible can never be exhausted. And then we also, from this word able, not only get the word dynamite and dynamo, but we also get the word dynamic. The word dynamic denotes power that produces action, activity, power that produces motion, as opposed to being static and stagnant. And maybe your life this morning is static, stagnant. You're not walking with God. You're not really going forward with God, maybe even as a professing Christian. You're not gaining ground with God. You're not moving forward. You need the power of the Word of God in your life continually. The Bible is likened unto a mirror. In James chapter 1, it shows us what we're like. It's likened unto a hammer in the book of Jeremiah. It breaks the rock in pieces. The Word of God is likened as well unto a fire. Jeremiah 23, it gives light. It purges. It purifies. It refines. The Word of God is likened unto a sword. It gives us victory. The Word of God is likened unto water. It cleanses. It purifies. The Word of God is likened unto seed, Luke chapter 8 and verse 11. And there's power even in a seed to bring forth a tremendous harvest. The Word of God is likened unto a light in a dark world. Thy Word is a lamp unto your feet and a light onto your path. When millions today have been saved and delivered and set free and transformed by the gospel that the Word of God declares. The Apostle Paul said, I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God unto salvation. I read years ago about an open-air preacher. He was declaring the gospel. A skeptic came up to him and challenged him. The skeptic was from a communist background, and he blazingly said, I am a communist. And he says, the philosophy that I embrace has got the ability to put a new suit on a man's back. He says, can your gospel put a new suit on a man's back? The preacher was wise. He says, my gospel can do much more than that. My gospel can put a new man in that suit. The gospel has got the power to change lives this morning. Whenever Martin Luther read those words, the just shall live by faith, Like a bolt of lightning, his heart was opened. His life was revolutionized. And all of mainland Europe in that time began to experience the breathings and the movings of God's Spirit as the power of the Word of God was let loose. In our text this morning, I see the privilege of knowing the Scripture. I see the power that is in the Scripture. And I also see, in closing, the purpose of the Scriptures. Look at what it says. That from a child, thou hast known the holy scriptures, which are able, and here's the purpose, to make thee wise unto salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. The purpose of the scriptures, first of all, if we just take out that little clause, which are able to make thee wise. In this precious book, The wisdom of God is revealed and the wisdom of God is imparted. If we close the Bible, we are closing the door and the gates to wisdom. And I don't think it's any surprise the further we get away from the Bible in our society, the deeper we enter into a place where there seems to be very little wisdom or common sense. The Bible says in Proverbs chapter 9 and verse 10, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. And if you turn that verse around, we could also say the lack of the fear of God is the beginning of stupidity. Close the Bible and men will come up with the craziest of ideas. We live in a world that seems to be spiraling out of control. I heard about an American senator just the other day, and he was saying in America that it is wrong to assign a person's gender on their birth certificate. 
because you couldn't possibly know what gender a person is until they come to the years of understanding and they choose and they decide their own gender. It's hard to think of anything more ridiculous than that type of philosophy. A world where we don't even know what a male or a female is any longer. Truths that have been self-evident from the beginning of time are now being called into question. And all of this talk as well about climate change, I confess I don't understand it. But I think it's ridiculous saying that cows should be made to wear nappies to try to reduce the spread of climate change while all the while we're cutting down forests and all sorts of things. And what do we do? We blame it on the cows. They're producing too much wind. And therefore, we should either cull them, reduce them, or at the very least, make them wear nappies to try to stop the spread of methane. Can you think of anything more ridiculous than that? You buy a packet of peanuts, and it'll say on small print on the back, warning, may contain nuts. What a revelation. What did you think it would contain whenever you saw the picture of the peanuts in the front of the packet that would contain something else? I brought a pair of shoes a while ago, and there was a little plastic sachet with silica gel inside, and it said on the front of the packet, do not eat. What type of person buys a pair of shoes and finds a plastic sachet filled with some type of chemical and thinks it's going to be a good idea if I eat this? Or the battery on your car filled with acid, sometimes it'll say on the side of the battery, warning, do not drink the acid. Friends, that's the world that we are living in. Now, I don't know about you, but if I was driving along the car and I was thirsty, the last thing I would do would be to stop the car, open the bonnet, and look at all of the containers under the bonnet and think, now, which one of these should I drink? If I was stupid enough to do that, I hope I'd have enough sense to maybe go for the radiator first and to drink the water out of the radiator. And if that didn't quench my thirst, maybe drink the fluid that cleans the windscreen and then maybe drink the oil after that. But I think the last thing I do would be to drink the acid out of the battery. But we are living in a world where people need to be told not to do such things because it's dangerous. Is it not indicative of a lack of wisdom? Common sense is not so common anymore. And if we cannot come up with sensible answers to the small questions in life without the Word of God, it is highly unlikely that man will come up with answers to the big questions in life. Where did I come from? Why am I here? What is the purpose of life? Who do I turn to whenever things go wrong? What about this guilt and emptiness within? How can I be ready for death? What happens after I die? And rather than opening the Bible and getting answers to these questions, we're sending satellites and rockets and probes and cameras and things onto the surface of Mars to see if they have got the answers for the problems that we're experiencing on this earth. The Word of God has the purpose of imparting wisdom that you're able to make thee wise unto salvation. God has given us this book to show us how we can be restored, how we can be redeemed, how we can be reconciled, how we can be cleansed and forgiven, how we can come to know our Creator in an intimate and in a personal way, how we can experience the best of life on this earth, and then how we can know joy for all of God's eternity. The Word of God is able to make thee wise unto salvation. You're maybe here this morning. Can I tell you today, if you're not a Christian, your greatest need is for God's salvation. Acts chapter 4, verse number 12. Neither is there salvation in any other, for there's none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. If you're not saved this morning, can I tell you, on the authority of this book, you need to be saved. You need to be saved now from sin's power, from sin's pollution, and from sin's penalty. And that salvation is found in Christ and in Christ alone. 
And the only reliable record we have of the person and work of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, is found in the Bible. We don't need anything outside the Word of God. It alone is forever settled in heaven. Can I encourage you today to get into your Bible? This holy book, given to us by a holy God, penned by holy men, inspired by the Holy Spirit to create a holy people. You could ask many people in our church service this morning, does the Bible work? Does it do what it says it does? And many will be able to affirm, yes, it does. The Word of God works. The Word of God is able to make you wise unto salvation. Great peace of they that love thy law. Forsaking all, I trust in him. And whenever you embrace the Christ of the Word and you embrace the Word of Christ, you can be sure and certain that you're saved, you're right with God, you're ready for heaven, and you're ready for home. People might mock, people might scoff. Somebody once said to me, you have been brainwashed. I said, you're right. My brain has been washed. Now are you clean through the word that I have spoken unto you. This world will pollute your mind, your thought, but the word of God has the power to wash and to cleanse and to renew and to sanctify this precious book that saves. What a word. What a book. May God write it upon our hearts this morning. 600, or sorry, 221 is our closing hymn. 221, come every soul by sin oppressed, there's mercy with the Lord, and he will surely give you rest by trusting in his word. 221, we're just going to sing verses 1 and 2 of this great old hymn, standing together as we sing. Verses 1 and 2, hymn 221. Father, we thank Thee for this precious book that God has given. Thank Thee, Lord, for every promise, every invitation, every word of counsel, and every word of comfort. From Genesis to Revelation, we thank Thee, Lord, for this precious book that is able to make us wise unto salvation through faith, which is in Christ Jesus. Give deciding grace even today to some perhaps who are not saved. God, grant that they might trust Christ fully and surrender their lives to Him. Part us now with thy blessing. Take us to our homes in safety. Watch over us throughout this day. Remember the service tonight. Glorify thy Son, for it's in Christ's name that we pray. Amen.